Welcome, welcome everyone uh, to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and we are just delighted and uh, grateful to have uh, Venerable Rubina Corton here, and I'll just say a word about her and then let her say yeah. the rest. Uh, I met Rubina, uh, we were just saying, I think over 15 years ago when yeah, she was so. director of the Liberation Prison Project here in San Francisco, or at least the build, there was a building in San Francisco. and. Uh, and and this was before I had even started dabbling in Buddhism. I, I barely knew what Buddhism was, but uh, Rabina really uh, made an impression on me. And I remember a couple of our conversations and coming to one of your talks, and it was really impactful. Um, and now here we are. Uh, Rabina oh, yeah. has been working for the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition for decades and uh and that's all i'll say i'll just let her uh, say the rest and 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 i'll just say for, one more thing for any of you who are here for the first time uh at the san francisco dharma collective we are a, a, a student run uh, dharma collective in san francisco we have a, an actual physical location i'm pointing to it um and we have classes in person and then we have hybrid classes and then some classes like this on zoom um, and we we are entirely supported by donations, and I'll put uh, links to uh, that later on in the chat. But um, we're really delighted to have you all with us. Welcome, and and then now I'll really shut up and give it to Rabina. No, it's okay. Come on. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here, and I'm so glad we meeting up again. It's wonderful. Um, yeah. So I think we've agreed we might talk about attachment and love. How to distinguish between them. I think it's a really great topic for us all, you know. So, okay. So I think, first of all, the, 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 the important thing is to get the word clear. You know, it's like in um, in Buddhism, this word attachment is really specifically used. It's, it's, it's enormously, bene it's enormously, it's huge in Buddhism. If we don't understand what Buddha means by attachment, period, we just don't understand Buddhism, period, you know. And if anybody's read even a half a book, you're going to find that word continually coming. Sometimes it's called craving, desire, all these different words. So it's crucial we get the clear definition from the Buddha because, you know, like as Lama Zopa says, when we hear in the ordinary, in our world, that you've got to, in order to get happy, you have to give up attachment. We, the, we go, oh, you mean I've got to give up my heart? I've got to give up my happiness? Because we have a very different definition of, of what it is. And that's including in our psychology. I mean, we talk in psychology about it's, it's an excellent quality you have. You, 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 you know, you bond with your loved ones, you attach to your family. So we've really got to be clear what the Buddha means by it. And like I said, it's it's fundamental to the understanding of Buddhism. So so the point in the Buddha's view about the mind, and really you could say that the mind is Buddha's expertise. I mean, that could be a surprise to us because I think we're so used to thinking of religion as sort of a different kettle of fish, you know. So Buddhism is philosoph religious philosophy, there's no doubt, but in a very different way because he doesn't posit a creator. People know at least that much about Buddhism. But it's about knowing your mind intimately and well for a very simple reason, because for the Buddha, from his analysis, which means from his own direct experience, because he's not a creator, Buddhism doesn't come from on high. It's not revelation. It's coming from this person who experienced what he presents as his findings. And that's the crucial point here. Um, that's why it's not a question of swallowing it whole and just believing in it, you know. It's, it's very experiential. He's found, the Buddhist view is, okay, like I said, the, the, the mind is his expertise. But to even give it a bit of background, I always quote this, the Dalai Lama said one time that it was these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. And I always like to joke that we arrogant Western people probably thought it was Freud a hundred years ago, you know? So we're now finally catching up and starting to have a little, with a little bit of humility, learning that there's this extraordinary knowledge about the human mind that's been around for centuries, you know? And it's marvelous that we're learning now. So the Buddha went through this amazing system of these genius Indian yogis and scholars as far as he could go. And then he diverged in his own direction, very specifically in relation to his own findings about the nature of self. So there's a lot of the things that the Hindu position, the Hindu presentation finds that he doesn't, doesn't disagree with. They're in the Buddhist view as well. This concept of karma, many, many findings very similar. But the crucial point is about the nature of self, finally. So then, but but that's that's a, that's one point. But the other thing is that the view of the mind is this. This comes from these Indians, you know, very amazing. 
but it's the, it's the center of the Buddhist approach. And the key point that is, is the essence of the Buddhist approach is that the Buddha has found from his own direct experience that um, we've all got this extraordinary potential. Potential for what? I mean, not just to be carpenters and musicians, but potential, I mean, very simply, for happiness, fulfillment, joy, contentment. I mean, it kind of sounds, oh, thanks, that's nice, you know. So this word nirvana actually is, um, is a word that's used to refer, not to some place like heaven, it's, it's referring to your mind when you've done this job that he says it's possible to do of utterly removing from your mind all, all, the, all the nonsense of ego and fears and drama and anxiety and attachment and jealousy and depression and low self-esteem and all this stuff that we are intimately familiar with. So the Buddha has found that this stuff is not at the core of our beings. This is a very simple point, and that we can rid the mind of it. So, of course, this sounds bizarre in our modern psychological views. According to neuroscience, it sounds like you're cutting out half your brain, you know, but it's not, it's not a question of that. So it's quite a different view. I mean, we all, I'm sure, hope in our lives. We know very well when we hear about anxiety and anger and depression, we know it's awful. We'd like to have a little bit less of it, please. But, but there's no view that actually says you can rid your mind utterly of it. In fact, we can't even imagine what you'd be like, you know. Like I said, we almost think you'd be half a person if you didn't have it. But this is the point that Buddha's making. This is, what he's, this is what he's saying. So it's quite a shocking concept, really. So therefore, we better know what he means by all this stuff. Okay, so the framework for understanding attachment and love is this view the buddha's view of the mind how it works and it's a very detailed very precise explanation not about in the way we describe in the west we describe very broad kind of broad stroke kind of um states of mind usually problems we don't you know we don't discuss positive states of mind much in well i mean we do obviously but you go to a therapist not because you've got a happy state of mind you go because you're miserable so we have all these different labels for different ways the mind works and causing suffering. But the Buddhist one is very specific and it's about the mind itself. You know, like when we go to psych we go to a therapist or whatever, um, we're going to be discussing our experiences. We're going to discuss our mother and our father and our genes and our DNA because they all play a role and they do indeed play a role. Buddha doesn't argue. But when you study the mind in Buddhism, you study the mind precisely which means the states of mind so what's fascinating the buddhist view this is not like the way we think they describe all the contents of our mind all these thousands of thoughts and feelings and emotions that came to be to be seem to be one big soup in our head you know chaotic half the time it's they're all described in terms of three categories there are the neurotic delusional aff emotional afflictions this is a common word in buddhist psychology the unhappy states of mind, the ones that the Buddha would say are the source of our pain and the source of why we make a mess of our relationships and harm others. And these are the ones we can get rid of. He's found that. Like, and, and so the key one there, one of the key ones is attachment. Another one is called aversion or anger. In fact, these two play a major role. We're going to discuss these particularly because they've got a very intimate relationship. So all these unhappy states of mind. Then you've got the positive states of mind, and we all know these as well, and they're our saving grace. I mean, basically in the Buddha's practice, in speaking simply, as we progress, if we're taking Buddha's methodology, you know, you're getting less neurotic, less jealous, less attached, less angry. And so what's the opposite? More kind, more fulfilled, more compassionate, more generous, more forgiving. I mean, so we've got the so-called negative qualities, the unhappy, miserable ones that so cause us so much pain. And we've got the positive ones. I mean, it's almost too simple an explanation, but this is the, this is the way they divide them in Buddhist psychology. It's very fascinating. There's other ways of dividing what's in the mind, but this is a really crucial one. So this third category, we won't go into this much here, but they're the, they're the states of mind that are neither neurotic nor virtuous, but they're very necessary, like concentration, good memory, all sorts of these. These are necessary to function. Whether you're a murderer or a meditator, you need good concentration. So that's this third category. But let's forget those. The, the crucial ones, the ones we need to become intimately familiar with so we can do this job of changing our mind, becoming a less neurotic, more wise, more content, fulfilled person. 
there's this division between the so-called negative and so-called positive, you know. We, and we hear that normally as quite punitive and sort of judgmental, but there's a lot of, there's, there's great meaning to it. So let's look at this. So from the discussion we've got here is what's the difference between attachment and love? So attachment is one of the main ones under the first heading, the neurotic unhappy ones, and love is one of the crucial ones under the next heading called the positive ones. So the trouble is for us, we practically use them, you know, spot, we practically use them synonymously. We don't know how to distinguish between them, and this is why we get into such a mess, you know. But before we even discuss them, this, it's really crucial to understand the Buddhist analysis of the qualities. What are the characteristics that make one of these states of mind so-called negative or destructive or unhappy or disturbing? Well, the key one, and this is a bit of a surprise to us, we'll go into this. The key function of all the unhappy ones, attachment, anger, jealousy, low self-esteem, arrogance, their key function, besides being miserable, besides causing us to be very miserable right there, and this we are very familiar with, the, the key function, it's a very curious one, is that they, they, they exaggerate. They're like, they embellish. They, they're not accurate in their assessment of things. This is a very curious way to put it. But I think when we explain, you will, we'll see how it works, you know. This is a really powerful point. Whereas the positive ones, the so-called virtuous ones, the reasonable ones, the useful ones, they're more in touch with reality. Very interesting, this. And I think we'll go into this and we'll look at it. So let's say, you know, you say you're in love with somebody. This is when attachment and love come together. Or you're for your child, it's the same thing. You, know, I mean, you say you love your child and if you're, you know, it's like a little baby who's totally perfect, you know, whose picture you would recognize among a million other pictures of babies immediately because, you know, you adore your baby or you adore your loved one, your beloved, you know, your partner, for example, before the, you know, before the negative things start to happen. So if you're in love, if you're in love with somebody, what we mean by in love is when attachment is out of control. And don't hear this as negative. I mean, we all understand it, but let's look at how it functions. And we know this. We recognize this. So especially in the beginning, when everything is so perfect and you're in love with somebody, we know they look totally perfect. Like you can't believe how divine this person is. I mean, it's like it's, it's so, and it's, it, what is interesting, it's so delicious. It's so joyful. You, the, the energy in the mind is completely out of control. You're totally blissed out. And of course, you think that's love. Well, love in the Buddhist analysis, the Buddhist definition of love, it's a, it, it's in the mind, and it's 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 a virtuous state of mind. Insofar as when you see another person who's happy, you immediately relate to that person. You delight in their happiness. May you be happy. That's what love means, and you can grow that to incredible degree. You know. If anybody, a stranger, enemy, doesn't matter, a stranger, anyone, you, you want them to be happy. May you be happy. And there are all these techniques, of course, in Buddhism to how to develop this love. Then you've got the same alongside that. You've got a thing called compassion, which is really when you see suffering, your heart reaches out and you think, oh, my God, look at that suffering. That's terrible. I wish a person didn't suffer. That's compassion. They're two of the major positive ones that we can see, we know. So love here, though, is the one that really plays a role in relation to into the people we're attached to. So you can definitely say that person you adore, the person you're in love with, for whom you have masses of attachment, that's what we're going to be describing. You definitely love that person. You definitely love that person. You want them to be happy. In fact, you do anything for them. When you're in love with them, you will do anything for them. You'll sacrifice your life. You'll spend money on them. You think of them day and night. You know, we all know that. And that's so, so the thing is, though, in this, especially on the Mahayana path, they describe how we're trying to cultivate is the ideal is as we get more advanced and learn to know our minds, we're trying to cultivate equanimity in relation to sentient beings and then develop love and compassion for all of them. So we can see the the problem with that is at the moment we've got friends, enemies and strangers. Think about it in the world. We have a friend who in these terms is the person we are attached to. We have enemies. And that's the person we have aversion for. Now, we might not say the word enemy, but we know what we mean. It's the person you can't stand. And that could probably be the ex-girlfriend, you know, because she's now cheating on you. 
suddenly she's gone from friend to enemy overnight brand so now in the beginning you had absolute attachment for her and now you have total aversion for her because why because she doesn't she hasn't done what your attachment wanted she cheated on you so and then you've got strangers and what we have for them is complete indifference you know so it's a, we can really see this this is 99 percent of the world and the way they describe is that the, the love we do have now for the friends, for the beloveds, for our special friends. And this is a normal world, but it sounds a bit shocking to think that it's limited because the Buddha is suggesting we can have love for everybody. As we get more advanced, we'll be able to do that, meaning wanting them all to be happy. But right now, it's only for the beloved. It's only the one that we're attached to. But of course, our problem is we see them as virtually the same state of mind, but they're completely different. They're like, as we say in England or Australia, they're like chalk and cheese. On the face of it, they look similar, but they're completely different states of mind. So attachment, let's look at attachment then. And it sounds rather depressing to hear about it, because when we do have attachment and we are in love with somebody, it's a very delicious feeling. No one's arguing with that because it does trigger very happy feelings. And the happy feelings aren't attachment. That's different. But they definitely triggers happy feelings, you know, no doubt about that. So attachment, as far as the Buddha is concerned in the Four Noble Truths, it's effectively the main cause of suffering in daily life, which is quite shocking to us to think this. So we better know what he means by that. So it's this distort. It's like the main voice of ego. The way Buddhism is describing the very the, the very root problem we all have, the most primordial mental problem, the most primordial affliction or delusion among this ones that they call the three poisons. We've all heard that phrase. Ignorance or ego grasping, which is this primordial sense of a separate, concrete, solid me. Then we have masses of attachment to get what that me wants. And then there's aversion or anger when it doesn't get what it wants. So it's a very intimate relationship between these three. So attachment is the default mode for most sentient beings. It's multifaceted. It's got a most primordial energy of attachment now in all of us, whether we're in love with somebody or not. It's, it's what drives all of us. As long as we are in samsara, quote unquote, the way Buddha describes, we've got attachment. And it goes to subtle, subtle, subtle degrees, you know, and it's multifaceted. So the most primordial level of attachment is really is dissatisfaction. And this is, we can see, is a, a terrible disease we have. The, the result of having practiced practice attachment in the past brings the consequence of having deep dissatisfaction, never thinking we've got enough, no matter what we get, no matter what we achieve, somehow it's never enough you know then and then when it's really severe and we all know this very well in our culture it's i am not enough it's a deep feeling that i am i am not enough it's a very painful experience this is the consequence of attachment that's one aspect of attachment then the next one is because you feel you're not enough or you feel you don't have enough then the next level of attachment is you hanker after something you think well what what's missing then you know and let's just say it's the it's the partner and you and you meet Fred or Mary, whoever you want to fall in love with. And suddenly, you know, this attachment is looking for someone out there, hankering after somebody, and, you, and, then, then, you, and then you find someone, and then you fall in love with this person. So attachment goes berserk. And this is the function here of attachment. Um, it exaggerates the deliciousness of the person. This is really clear. Forget about just a person. What about chocolate cake? If you're attached to chocolate cake, we know perfectly well that when your stomach is empty and the cake is on the plate and all the things are all ready to, you know, to eat it, it looks absurdly delicious to you. We know that, which is why we can't resist it. Because the cake looks so delicious. It's like vibrating deliciousness. And this sense of, you know, the key, again, the key function of attachment would be emotional hunger, this feeling of missing something, of not having enough. So that's when food it comes into food, people, relationships, you know what? This is all attachment, dissatisfaction, emotional hunger, hankering, manipulating to get the thing, to get the person. And then when it comes to the person, then a very powerful part of attachment is to expect that person to make me happy it's a deep and all this is unspoken it's just deep habit in us from the buddha's view from having practiced it for so long we just fall into the trap of this attachment you know and we don't 
actually analyze it as necessarily negative. And because in the beginning, especially it triggers such delicious feelings because there's no arguments yet. You all, you think each other is divine. Everything is perfect. You see each other occasionally. It's all exciting and wonderful. And then you move in together and then the problems start. We all know that. The attachment starts to get diminished. Why now? This is the point. Because the key point about attachment, this is where a primordial way that attachment functions, a way that almost summarizes it. It's um it's as part of us, and it's there every second. This is the Buddha's view, that is all, all the time it only wants everything to be lovely. It can only handle everything being nice. This is really primordial. In other words, a th so a thousand times a day, you know, you can put it this way, your attachment won't get what it wants. It's this junkie in us that only wants everything to be nice, which means only wants what I want. So it's like intensely self-centered, in other words. So we do have love and compassion and they mitigate. They are our saving grace. But you could argue if you don't have much love and compassion and don't have much love, you know, forgiveness and, and compassion and kindness, then you'll have a pretty nightmarish relationship. You'll be, you'll be like a vampire. You'll, you'll eat her up for breakfast and then chuck out the bones and get another person because attachment is totally self-centered. It's, it's a symptom of, of, of self-centeredness. It's very interesting. It's needy, it's, exp it's expectation, it's possessiveness with absolute certainty. She is mine, as if she's an extension of you. We see that with babies, you know, and children. Parents assume they made that baby. And so it's like as it, it's, it's if an it's extension of them. That's the intensity of attachment, intense possessiveness as mine. So it's, it's, uh, it's emotional hunger, hankering, emotional neediness, feeling lacking, therefore you have to search for something, you find, and then it exaggerates their deliciousness, and then you, it exaggerates their role in making you happy. The expectation is they have to make you happy, that you expect that cake to bring you pleasure. You expect that person to make you happy, to give you pleasure. In other words, to do what your attachment wants. This is why it can be so fierce and such some, some relationships can be such nightmares. It's because of attachment. It's, it's primordially deep, you know. So if we have any love and compassion, that's our saving grace. Then you'll have a reasonable relationship. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll be patient. You'll be kind. You won't, you, you, you know, attachment won't run the show in the, in the way that it manipulates. Attachment manipulates and controls. It's really multifaceted, which is quite surprising to us because, it's not, you know, you don't read these words, but this is exactly the way attachment works. And we become more and more familiar with it. And it's always there. It's anxiety based. It's, it's always worried that things go, won't go well. It's always trying to manipulate to make things go the way I want. And then when things go wrong, we have a panic attack and that's called aversion that's called anger that's called upset frustrated annoyed irritated i mean we're very familiar with all this you know this is the buddhist analysis the buddhist just very brief you know in five minutes an analysis of it or a description of these states of mind so of course this is the theory we have to learn to become familiar with this and this is why we have to learn to meditate so we start paying attention to our mind and then a thousand times a day trying to catch this attachment when it rises up before it's too late you know this is the approach so love is a is is a valid state of mind virtuous state of mind it's appropriate it's in sync with reality it doesn't cause distress it's a delight in someone's happiness it's the source of any it's it's the source of any happiness you will have in your relationship that makes it worthwhile you know this is the idea so they're very different states of mind but we basically mix them completely you know, we really confuse them. And so this is why this Buddhist way of presenting them is quite helpful if we start to apply it. Then we can see the difference, you know. In other words, you know, if I'm in love with Fred or Mary and, you know, everything's hunky-dory, everything's all perfect, and then suddenly she doesn't look at me perfectly and I'm having a panic attack, oh, my God, she doesn't love me anymore. Or you might get upset, then you get angry, you get paranoid, you know, or the person comes home five minutes late, you freak out. That's attachment not getting what it wants. That's attachment running the show. And when it doesn't get what it wants, that's what rises as anger, aversion, upset, irritated. So we've all got different styles. Some people have very strong anger. Some people have very subtle, mild anger, 
very hard to very hard to identify and that kind of person because their attachment won't get what it wants every second either but when that kind of person more quiet kind of person when their attachment doesn't get what it wants their aversion returns into kind of eventually turns into depression you know depression and anxiety and and fear and uh, like despair even it builds up you know so this is just rough, a little bit. Just on now, I think I'd really like you to talk, ask, let's have a discussion now about these things. Just, that's a, just a basic little intro. So now let's have some questions. Come on, people. Let's unpack it all. Anyone, just stick your hand up, turn your mute off, whatever you want, and talk to me. Anything in the chat there? Uh, I, I can't find my raise hand thing, but I have one. Oh, there you go. Don't you worry, darling. I can see you. You talk to me, sweetheart. Um, <clears throat> I, um, all of that makes sense. And I find that I trip the most over uh, realizing that I'm upset because of, uh, because of attachment to somebody, That's right. not necessarily That's right. to somebody, but my expectations about how the relationship right. is supposed to work. Um, That's, right. That's right. I don't know what to do then. Like that thing where you just said, where like noticing it arising so you can nip it in the bud. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I've, I'm, I've missed that part and I'm in it and what next? I know, T, I know. You see, the thing is, what, what we notice, isn't it, that what we notice is that thoughts are never stopping in our head. Would you agree with that? Thoughts are never stopping. This is just constant. And we just think this is normal. Well, the Buddha would say we're all mentally ill because he's got methods where we can learn to control our mind, which is marvelous to know that they're there when we're able to practice them one day, you know. But we can learn to sort out this crazy head of ours. We can learn to, to you know, just, just subdue all the crazy thoughts and grow all the positive thoughts. That's the job. But, oh, my goodness, it takes time. So we've got to be very patient. So exactly right that, you know, expectation that some, that, that the expectation that the cake responds in exactly the way your attachment expects or the expectation that a person does what you attachment wants. That's really powerful way that we suffer when it's not met, isn't it? And that's inevitable because we're all human. So whether the person did it purposely or our expectation was exaggerated, and often it is exaggerated, we demand more of this person than they even know we even want. And this is the problem with attachment. It does demand more than the person is capable of giving. It's a fantasy. Then it's, um, there's a multitude of approaches, you know, much of the thing, I mean, it's really, I say seriously that really Buddha, in one way, day-to-day -day application of Buddhism, he really is a brilliant cognitive behavioral therapist and i mean this very very sincerely uh, an ordinary level of day-to-day -day practice is more and more skillfully catching those thoughts and then hearing sweetheart hearing what they're saying so it's it's very quick because they go so quickly and our part of our problem here is because we're not from in our culture we haven't been taught these and these these days more and more we're doing it to pay attention to what the hell is going on in our minds. Our problem is, Tia, we, I say it like this, we wait till the wheels are falling off. So you know, like I joke and I mean it sincerely, we would never wait till our wheels fall off before we did something about our car. We watch when they're wobbling and then we go to the mechanic. So wheels just don't fall off. But emotionally, we, we wait till the dramas happen. And then almost you can say it's a little bit late. The best you can do is damage control. But even still, as you become more familiar, as you start to practice, and I, I'm, you're, it's implying that you are, then you're going to catch your mind more and more, and you're going to hear, you know, you feel the hurt, like the stab, you know, and, but you've got to catch, this is one approach, catch the thoughts. So what would you, what, how would you articulate your, give it some words when a person doesn't meet your expectation? Say some words for what that expectation, what how um, that hurt, thought and expectation. So, how what it's saying? So, um, 
like like the the thing that happened or the the no, like you know happened. let's say let's say you know let's say you expected me to turn up to ring you at 5 p.m and have a chat and mm -hmm. you're really looking forward to it and i don't call so what what's your mind say um uh interestingly enough with 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 those kinds of of ones my uh my working through the i had an expectation and the checkpoints right did did we share that expectation am i sure we shared that expectation did something happen right so strangely enough like that exact instance like my compassion shows up oh maybe something happened like oh, okay. go there more okay. quickly then well, which is which is an example of one where you, you the feel where you feel the hurt um, good point yeah so i might be bummed that 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 didn't happen but i'm not uh that so angry, where is one that, that angry part where, doesn't happen of like so where, what an example you know the, the, example? that that fish shaking why <laughs> or why not <laughs> give us an example of one of those um so this week i um uh a friend of mine was uh traveling and i thought they were traveling uh back to california to local to to me and um uh i found out that they had traveled to somewhere else in the united states and i was just like when did i fall off the list of people who were like in the loop about okay. what's going on okay now good now i'm understanding so let's analyze this one okay there's a multitude of things going on there so that's yeah, you know, this almost sounds a bit corny, but this is really the Buddhist way of talking. It's it, it the Buddhist view labels these different unhappy states of mind, and we are familiar with them, Tia. So the one there is your you, you didn't, she didn't, she she didn't meet your expectation. But the response that's not that's attachment, but it's more like per, it's like personal insult, which is pride. And that flips into low self-esteem. That's in because pride is an over-exaggeration of who you think you are. But we mostly have the flip side, which is an under-exaggeration. Oh, I'm not important. That one is is not just attachment, but it leads also to that other one. You offended the person, you know, because your words showed exactly that's called pride, which flips into low self-esteem. She, I'm not important. That's that one. Can you hear me? So that we've got to be able to label these different states of mind. I mean, almost too simple, but we don't have to worry about what our mother did to us and what happened 27 years ago. You just check up inside and you, because you said those words, those words indicated, those words showed it. Who do you think, how, you know, who am I then? Where do I fit into this? How come I don't deserve to be told? That's exactly, I mean, it sounds boring to call it pride, but it's very powerful for all of us. And we mainly experience the flip side of it. I'm nobody. I'm not important. This is our, a big suffering we have. Do you, do you recognize what I'm saying? Thank you. So it's like catching and you've got to put the words to it. Like I said, words to it. And that tells you the unhappiness. That tells you the, you know, I'm nothing. When we have, that's a very common one. Or who do you think she is, you know? I'm more important than that sort of thing. And that's a very common one we all experience, but it feels almost embarrassing to say it's pride because I think very rarely we would not admit to being proud. We would not admit to being arrogant. We usually think we're, we're smaller, you know, but they're, they're very related. Arrogance over-exaggerates your importance and low self-esteem exaggerates your unimportance. They're both distorted views. Do you understand my point? I mean, they're all coming together you know, attachment, anger, pride, they're all like brothers and sisters, you know, they're very interesting. They've all got a, they've all got a way of talking. And that's why it's powerful to hear what they're saying conceptually. And then you can argue with it. Well, give it a break. Come on, come on, Rabina. She, it's not as bad as that. She probably didn't even realize she hadn't told me. You've got to argue with it to, to bring yourself down, to calm yourself down, to sort of nurture yourself. It's all right. And let's just find the facts before I start jumping into conclusions, that kind of thing too, you know. Do you understand, Tia? Yes, very thank good point. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What else there? Anybody else there? No. No other questions. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, um, a good talk, talk to me, darling. Um, Smears in Australia. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you. I jumped in on this. So that was very um, oh, fortuitous yeah, um, from rainy Australia. And, yes. um, you know, you often talk about zip the lips. I like that um, quick method. <laughs> um, 
But awesome. along these lines, there's um, a few things, uh, a sort of solid example, I think, is I think I struggle a lot between events happening and feeling um, that then I have said something from a place of feeling like it's, um, I guess, critical inquiry, like where I haven't just taken something at face value, but I've thought about it and gone, you know, I don't think that's quite what it is and expressed like my feeling about it to someone to or a group of people and, mm-hmm. um, and then afterwards felt um, misunderstood or that I've been judgmental and I shouldn't have said anything or that I've upset people by doing that. And I get in, mm-hmm. a, in a quandary about that because a part of me feels like it is important to say something mm-hmm. about those things or about a different would it be a, perception would it be a personal of, thing or a political issue would it be a um, criticism of something else what would it be uh, An example? okay so that's a really good example so for me I often will hear I'll give you a really solid example that happened this week because I know that helps to have something solid um, and factual so I sometimes join in because I lived in San Francisco in Fairfax so locationally you might know where that is and you know Jack Cornfield and Spirit Rock so I've been you know around that community and they also do online zooms and it's at a time of day where often if I'm at home I'll I'll tune in you know to listen to the talk and then they have breakout groups and sometimes I've joined those breakout groups and often I won't say anything and I'll just listen but um I do have this sense often, and this is the part that feels judgmental, where I feel like it's very um, me-centred, the way people are talking. It's all about um, self-help and how can I make myself better and it's all, you know, the smoke from my next-door neighbour's barbecue came over the fence and I had to practice not being attached. You get a bit annoyed about I do I get judgmental because I go well you know my reality and this is real my reality is friends you know of mine um 20 year old got shot by the police you know so so that I understand exactly the point now so I understand so this is first of all I mean so first of all Okay, so we're talking about you then. So that the so the first of all, aside, I mean, everything's relative. So if you're in the middle of the, you know, if if I would suggest that maybe if one of the people in that group had their shot, shot their kid just shot by the police, and you're worried about the fire coming across from the next door neighbour, that would be inappropriate. But at a, in a that's just one point. But the real one we're discussing is your response. So there will mm-hmm. so what you're suggesting. Is, you have a you, you say judgmental, which means you have you got annoyed. You get which is a mild anger. Now that's and that's the first point. And then you make a point to people, and then you feel bad, and then you think, oh my god, I shouldn't have said it. And then you feel that maybe they're criticizing. You. Well, that's then attachment to being liked. So first of all, anger arises because your attachment's not getting what it wants, and you think there's much more serious things happening in the world. And you're right, but I think it's a relative thing. You know, maybe in that situation, it's appropriate to be personal because it's about that. And then, but the other, so that's your anger, that's your, your anger. And then you feel bad about it, which is your guilt. And then it's, you're worried they have, they, they uh, I don't like you now, which is because attachment wants to be loved. So there it is. It's like a naked little net, naked, naked little workshop in attachment and anger. Samia, can you hear it? Yeah. And I, and I get yeah, all of often, that. But often, darling, often, sweetheart, pardon? I, pardon? I do get all of that stream. Like I watch that yes. happens but yeah the the, the dilemma for me is that those things are still um so okay so what do you mean the instance, dilemma John? at the beginning at the beginning of when they do the breakout they'll go um so we're just going to talk about you know ourselves and you know we're not going to talk about politics and I get that from the level of, okay, we're not going to talk about Donald Trump and the parties and, you know, like that's not what we're doing. But on another level for me, like what happens to other people is I'm not separate from that. I know, I know. So then, but then I think if you just, I mean, okay. What were first of all, what I the analysis was you got up, you got upset because you, your attachment 
they were talking about what you thought they wouldn't be talking about. So if we, they, you see, you might be right. Let's just put it this way. You know, let's put it this way. What we observe in the world might be accurate. So you might even be accurate in your assessment. Let's just say that. But that's not the issue here. The issue is what it makes you feel. You you get angry, then you criticize, and then you feel guilty about criticizing, and then you think they dislike you. That's what we're discussing. We're not discussing whether or not that it's valid they talk that way. That's not the discussion here. We're discussing each individual, each one of us right this moment, we're looking into, like, for example, you know, in the case just before, we're looking into what it is in our own mind that is causing the distress. That's the discussion. In this case, this is a discussion. So are you communicating with me? And the fact is, you know, these talks are like that. So you don't, I mean, don't go to them. I mean, that's a very easy way to put it because it's only going to distress you if they're going to be talking about what you think they shouldn't be then. But what we're talking about here is giving an analysis of what's in your mind that makes you miserable. One is attachment to being the way you want. Then there's aversion and then there's guilt. And then there's attachment to reputation. It's four things there. So, I mean, that's for you to think about. Join the universe, sweetheart. We all know we've got these, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Good, darling. Thank you so much. Who else is there? What else is there? Yes, Julie, talk to me. Hi. So this Hi. Um, kind of as a extension to that question or kind of in yes. the yes. area. Um, so, um, so it sometimes it feels very odd to me that so much of the practice is, especially I've been trying to understand Satipatthana stuff, and it's like so much of it is uh, getting the discipline of concentration by focusing on me, you know, the sensory um, inputs that are happening to me in my body in this moment. In, and it feels very almost sometimes claustrophobic phobic like does it matter what in a sense I'm wondering does it matter what the object of concentration is does it have to be me you know I understand um okay I think it's important okay as opposed to what you mean it's embarrassing to make it you or you feel it's self-centered if it's you what are you actually saying is the problem with it being you you said claustrophobic what do you mean really? I, I i guess um to tell you the truth the thing that i think about is you know that our, our time on this earth is finite I've, I've done a lot of stuff i've worked really hard done a lot of things you know and now i just feel like i would be really um uh, great if i could just look at the world if i could just spend time okay okay now i understand so listen to me i think this is the key point you know the buddhist teachings they're very progressive they're incremental they're gradual the very first level of buddhist teachings given he's saying that we're all driven by attachment and delusions the very first level is not even about the mind it's his suggestions that we have good ethics so he suggests well don't kill don't steal don't lie control your body control your speech try not to eat too much cake and have a, a very disciplined quiet life live in some precepts i mean he's only talking to us individually he is only talking to us it's got nothing to do with other people yet we have to become intensely internal first and that's just even controlling our body and speech now the next level of practice you get even more internal by now you learn to meditate and now you learn to understand your mind which is the most intensive internal thing you will ever do in the universe and to the degree of subtlety that we don't even ex ex doesn't even exist in modern psychology we need to get in touch with our own mind to unpack and unravel it julie because what's causing us all our pain and suffering is right here in the mind then you go to the compassion wing given that you've controlled your body speech and mind you've got some degree of contentment and clarity now you open your eyes and you go oh my god we're all in the same boat now we start to help others it's one step at a time if we can't handle looking at i then we haven't even begun the work it's not self-centered, it's common. It's, it's, it's an intelligent way to look into the eye, to start to find what the problems are that are causing me so much suffering. Then with that analysis, I can now understand the suffering of everybody. And that's my other point to Samia. When we can see, you can, she's looking outside and thinking they're all being self-centered and she's probably right. 
but we've got to see what it is in us that gets annoyed about that, which means it must be inside us as well. Otherwise, we wouldn't be annoyed about it. So we have to learn from what we see on the outside too, you know, that triggers our own stuff. You see what I'm saying, Samia, there? It's a really good point. Do you hear me, darling? I, I, I think I don't, I'm, I might not. I think there's something else that I'm trying to get at and I'm, maybe I'm just having trouble articulating it. I so think I get... Finish. I brought up your point to say, Julie, so we are oh, communicating sorry. with Julie. No, no, please, it's okay, darling, stay there, stay there. Julie, did you understand what I'm saying? Yes, thank you. Good, good. So uh, have we got time, is there more, just before you go on, Samia, are there more people there? No, are there more people? So you have, good, darling, you talk to me. Good, go on, go on now. Talk to me. Um, boy, I was just nodding along to everything you were saying, and then when you got to the children, I was having a really strong reaction, you know, um, my Which son, children? my son is, is 30. What is he now? He's almost 32. Uh, oh, I see. And, and, and you know, I've actually gone through a lot of thinking about this in the last few years because he has done some detaching from me, which was very painful, but it's hard. It's, I, I have a much easier time understanding the distinction between love and attachment with anybody else in the world, but not my son, <laughs> you know, and oh, it's something inevitable. about it's caring for the baby that feels that's like right. I can see, I think intellectually, I can see how it's separate from attachment, but I'm not sure I can. But I just wondered if no, you could say more about I, it. No, I understand that. So when it comes to the baby, for sure, when it's a tiny thing, I think, well, first of all, you got to, I'm using the Buddhist view, you've got to look into the karmic one. We talk about it in biology, but let's look at the Buddhist view, which is karma. So this powerful history between you and this person from countless past lives is why they'd say it. And how come this person came to your, they came to your body, they got born in your body, did they? Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's right so then that's pretty intense that's a pretty intense connection to have with a person where they actually get born in your body i mean you can't imagine anything more powerful than that so clearly there's a powerful relationship between you and this person and that's to whatever degree we have that as a parent you know it's and it can vary enormous so there's already massive so that's already implying attachment incredible attachment because it's close close connection and we can also see some children the mothers can't stand them parents can't stand this baby in their body i mean we think that's shocking in the west but that's the karma between people where the parent doesn't like the child or the child doesn't like the parent that's clear too so it's it's one thing is having them as your child the attachment is very powerful there when it's, you, that you see them as incredible. It's love and compassion. And when you say that to, to take care, that's love and compassion. Yeah. And then it's even fierce when it is for an object of attachment, like mm -hmm. the love and attachment, like the, the love we have for our beloved, if it's a partner and you're in love with them, th there is attachment there. And the love you have is tremendous for them. It's an extra special, powerful love, isn't it? It's still yeah. love, you know? Yeah. So you understand. Well, I think yeah, you're making me you think power. of two things. One is that I think yeah. when somebody we love also requires some care, that increases yes. the bond, right? And maybe it increases attachment. But but the second, which I think just listening to you now is came up for me, is that I think that as a parent, you end up not at the beginning, but at some point, you end up with a little bit and this is, must be part of attachment, but like a feeling of entitlement of like, I'm entitled. Oh, that's very much, that's attachment. Love, very much, very which, much, that's attachment. Totally attachment. Yeah, it's I bet. Yeah. yeah. No, that is definitely attachment. When it's love and compassion, love and compassion and the other virtuous states of mind yeah. have more sense of connectedness with others in a yeah. wholesome way. But the right. delusions are more kind of cut off and, and sort of jagged and, yeah. you know. Yeah. Very, very, very different feeling. Very, very different. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. What else is there, people? Points. That's a really good point. Thank what you. else is there, dear people? We've got time here. We've got time to talk more. Come on. Yes, Amir, talk to us. Yeah. Um, well, your description of attachment, just like... Uh, in terms of being in love, which is like described to a T, my <laughs> relationship, uh, very unhealthy relationship with uh, a woman that I've been in and out of uh, with. And so that was, 
enlightening <clears throat> to a degree, just in terms of like, just feeling the, you know, just how self Oh, it's stuck. It's stuck on me. Can you hear me? No. Maybe he'll come back later. Let's have another question. Anyone else? Hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Erica, talk to me. I find that I am very stuck in an attachment aversion cycle with our prison uh, with my body because I am a chronically ill, semi-disabled person. Um, and I feel like I am constantly, my all of uh, my attachment is to my body being well or not hurting, even in meditation. Uh, yes. aversion to it's almost like any pain now or you know I'm I, I become so locked in and it exactly it really is a lot of my mind and how I make oh. decisions mm -hmm. and how I function mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it is a lockdown it is a challenge to be in mm -hmm. in a body that is dysfunctioning or right. not fully mm -hmm. able and so, it's hard to separate my mind from that vessel or to not be angry. And I think, I mean, I'm better, I get better, but I realize mm -hmm. that so much is uh, mm -hmm. attachment, addiction to my body. Yeah, and exactly. It it. Exactly. Yeah. I know I, it's tremendous. I mean, the body is so totally, I mean, as far as we are in concerned in the modern world, we are only the body. It's like this one unified lump of me, you know? We don't even distinguish between mind, body, speech. It's just this one lump of me. And the body, and even if it's healthy body, we're still obsessed with it. It's just natural. Everybody is like that. It's the main attachment. And they even say at the time of death, you know, the main attachment to let go of is, is not the beloveds or anything. It's the body, just this primordial, because we assume that's the I, you know. So, of course, you're you're obsessed with your body. This is just, of course, it is, especially when there's pain. I mean, whenever I get a little bit of pain, you know, I think about that. I can't even imagine having pain all the time. I just can't even imagine it. And this is the part about attachment. It's so primordial. Every second attachment is working. It's attachment to having it something be nice. And the millisecond the not nice happens, which is the pain in your body, then attachment shifts to being free from it. So you can't escape it, you know. And it's, it'll be, I mean, it, to, you'd be an advanced spiritual being if you weren't this way. That's why depending on your mind and how much you can cope with it and if you and how much you think you can get better you know there are amazing ways of changing our attitude i know even in the ordinary world in the, in the medical system there's lots of approaches now which are cognitive ones to interpret the pain differently and that takes a lot of courage you know but we need we've got sometimes we've got no choice and with you you say you're getting better you mean you're getting better at interpreting things differently or your health is getting better both. both both well that's good so you so you so you're moving towards good health then it's been about a decade and it is i'll be about it oh. i think i'll always be at 80 percent um okay but my brain is also my mind is also better good but i'm still stuck so, I, see, still... That, I think this is the, this is the major one this is the major one you know so this is the point about um this is the essence of the buddhist approach actually you know, when I, when I like to use extreme examples of people in a prison, a prison is not a body, but it's a pretty immutable thing that you can't move out of. You got, mm -hmm. don't have the key. You can't make it the furnishings better. You can't stop the noise. It's pretty immutable, you know. So when I use examples of my friends in prison who really transformed their mind in in the way they interpret the prison, and this is the essence of what Buddha is saying. If they, there's a saying, if you can change something, well, then please change it. Yeah. But the real work starts when we can't. And then we have two options, go completely crazy or literally, literally learn to reinterpret the experience. And that's exactly the same as the body or an external event. That's the essence of the practice, you know.
that's the essence of it and the and the and the power of this is because we tend to so be so caught up in um assuming that well of course i'm angry i just stubbed my toe we don't even question that one is anger and the other's the pain they're separate events you know but we assume we don't have a choice of course i'm angry i'm in prison of course i'm angry look what my boyfriend did so the miracle is to see that yes we do have the choice i mean i always quote this woman in prison i quote her all the time sunny accused 45 years ago of you know murdering two policemen with a husband hitching in florida they get accused of murder they're on death row she's in prison in isolation for years husband gets executed his brain bursts into flames she loses her kids she loses her family one nightmare after another enough to make her go mad which is not uncommon among people in prison because it's so nightmarish she said i knew i had the choice I knew, she said, I, I could change my mind. She's such an amazing example because she wasn't Buddhist. She wasn't anything. She just had this powerful emotional intelligence. She could see that the prison was one thing and her way of interpreting it was another. This is the essence of Buddha's entire experience, entire uh, practice. That's it. We can change our mind. And we are the beneficiaries of that. So well done, girl. Keep moving, Erica. It's great. It's tough work, though. Absolutely. Who else is there? Then? Amir is back. I don't know if he wants to try again. Mm. Yeah, good. Try again, yeah. Amir. Yeah, my Wi-Fi died just as I was talking. But um... <laughs> so give us a question. What's your question? What's your question, Amir? Oh, I guess just the question was like, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just a question about Buddhism, but then, you know, how do you move? I mean, I'm always going to have the attachment towards a romantic partner, but how do you move from from it being self-centered? I mean, I guess that's the topic well, of that's this the question. That's talk. Me, this is the perfect question. The fact that you asked the question shows that you know there's an answer. And if you take this simple view in Buddhism... That you've got the neurotic, deluded, ridiculous, eye based states of mind, attachments, the boss of them. And then you have your virtues, Amir. You recognize the word kindness, you recognize the word patience, forgiveness, generosity, humility. You recognize those words. Well, then guess what? The antidote to the others is to practice those. So, you know, it's the direct antidote to attachment is to give is to be detached. But if you can't do that, then practice being more patient, practice being more loving, practice um, seeing the person in a different way, you know, not just through the lenses of your own needs, because attachment is very needy. Attachment is self-centered, but love and compassion are opposite. They're not self-centered. So that's a direct antidote. Practice the positive qualities. Do you understand? No. Slowly, slowly. Come on. I mean, you probably are doing that, but you're not giving yourself credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing, just to say it, I mean, it might be helpful to you, I don't know. But really, the more we understand the way Buddhism analyzes attachment, it is the symptom of a very suffering person. We've all got it. Join the universe, Amir. You know, we've all got it. It's the symptom of, of a very, uh, it's, 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 its essence is emotional hunger. So think about it. If you're hungry, it means you, you don't feel you've got enough. So that's the real thing to try to look at. What is it in us? What is it in you that is you think that's lacking that causes you to put all this emotional neediness onto someone else as if by having them, it'll fill up the gaping hole. That's the pain of attachment because it doesn't. It just increases more emotional neediness. So we, another way, another answer is we have to learn to discover our own qualities. We have to learn to become our own self, more fulfilled within ourself, more content with ourself. That takes practice. You with me? Good. So, how long have we got? We got an hour, or is it an hour and a half? What's the story? Uh, we have until seven thirty, so we have another. Uh, sorry, that's Pacific time. We have another half hour if if we okay, want. Sure. Sure, there, people. there is people a, a comment and question in the chat. Can sure. I read it? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, Christine says, "I would like to ask about attachment to uh, quote living unquote." 
karma and a near-death experience I had. Uh, sorry, a near-death experience. I had a near-death experience in the hospital. It was as if I was watching what was happening, but did not feel and could not hear. How do I understand this from the Buddhist perspective? My well, current karma. Well, that would be, I see, and then, Christine, yeah. So that's really, um, you were actually, it sounds like you were going through this dissolution process or this deconstruction, which is described in great detail, especially in the Vajrayana teachings, this gradual deconstruction of the components of your person. First, your gross, your grosser level of your body, and then you, move, you are gradually moving towards what they call your subtle consciousness, which is what you experience when you dream. So you are getting a taste of that. You are vividly aware, but your senses weren't aware. It was your subtle consciousness. So that's very, that, that's how it is. And then what happened was you didn't die. You came back again. So I'm very glad you did, Christine. Yeah, that's your subtle consciousness. Did you want to ask more about that, Christine? Do you want to talk to me about it? Uh, thank you, Venerable, very much. Thank you. Um, while I have an amazing medical care team who was very, very much on it, but in looking at it through a Buddhist lens, is it just determined that my karma for this life cycle is not done? And that yeah, that's all. No... Your petrol tank of karmic, your petrol tank of morality of non-killing, to be very specific, hadn't run out yet. You had some kind of, you had some kind of experience of um, sickness, but it didn't, it wasn't complete. So you didn't die, darling. I'm very happy. Thank you I very much, Venerable. Well done, Christine. You're okay now, are you? Doing better. Still on chemo, but doing much better. Thank you. Good, sweetheart. I'm very glad you didn't die yet. I'm very happy. Yeah, what else, people? Something else. Me again with another comment in the chat. Oh, good, good, good. I'm right. It says I don't have enough bandwidth for video, but I just wanted to say how grateful I am for this program. How do we know when we have very little attachment left? Is it something like living in ordinary joy? Well, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't, I don't know what ordinary joy means, but put it this way the way the Buddhism would describe. So if we take it being an ordinary person full of attachment and anger and jealousy and confusion and fears, and you vomit out whatever you feel and you hurt people. I mean, it's a fairly normal person. We're not, have to be, we're not talking Hitler here, an ordinary unhappy person. So then you start to work on yourself and you control your body, you control your speech, you live in precepts, you calm the servants of your mind down. And that also, you know, so you don't jump on every boy you feel like, you don't eat every piece of cake you look at, you learn to become more disciplined, which means already, if you're doing it properly, more fulfilled more content and then you start to work on your mind and then you start to recognize the attachment and the aversion and you begin to have more control over your mind this is the ideal scenario so as and when you progress along this path you get you, you as you lessen the the, the the uncontrolled body speech and mind you literally become more fulfilled when as you give up more emotional hunger as you give up anger and upset as you give up anxiety as you give up the jealousy you're it's like you're healing your mind and you become more content and more fulfilled and more yes joyful literally but more loving and compassionate as well if, if you if you're just getting more joyful but don't much care about others something's missing because as you lessen the delusions which are what cut us off from others you become more connected to others automatically as well as joyful so if that's happening then honey child you're on the right path what else Nothing. Well, then maybe we should talk. I don't know what else. Another, I mean, we can keep going on the same topic. Of course, I can. We can take, we can talk about it for years, you know, attachment and aversion, attachment and aversion. But um, it would be lovely for the work questions. It really, for me, it really touches on the things that are most important because everyone brings up their own points. So there's nothing there you want to talk about, people? To me, why don't you discuss what you're trying to say before? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, before, I was going to jump in with another. Oh, no, okay. We'll have Samia first. Go on, Samia. But but before I say, before you say something, Samia, basically, there's two things going on in the world. One is our mind, 
Now, one is the the event out there. So whether that's group in your group on Zoom, whether it's the person's son being murdered by the police, whether it's Mr. Trump doing this, whether it's the worst nightmare in the universe, or whether it's the most delicious thing in the universe. There's the events in the outside world, and then there is our mind and our response to those things. So then now, given that, then we have two aspects to ourselves, as I've been discussing. We have the eye-based, deluded, neurotic, unhappy, attached, angry, jealous response to the world. And then we have the virtuous response to the world, intelligent, wise, clear. So there's two parts of us, the neurotic parts and the valid parts, and they all come along together. So let's say in relation to your experience, some wisdom in you might have been accurately assessing that in fact, they were all being self-centered. You might well be right. We're often right in what we see. When we look at the world, we are right when we see there's a war in Russia. We are right when we see a policeman murder a child and say it's inappropriate. So we can be right in many things we see. That's virtue. That's wisdom. That's intelligence. But now getting angry about it, getting upset about it, being attached to our own outcome, that's the stuff that makes the mess. And that's the stuff that we have to learn to distinguish between. And then if we are right in our assessment, we have to see whether we have the wisdom to respond appropriately. And that would mean, is it beneficial for me to say something? And if something, if it is beneficial to say something, that means the people's ears have to want to hear what I have to say. Sometimes it's beneficial to speak and sometimes it's beneficial to shut the mouth. So now, given all that, tell me what you wanted to say, darling. <laughs> I feel like I should say nothing. Um, I th uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's... And that's our skill. Go on. I, I feel like more what it is is a thing where I have a sense of being misunderstood, um, that I'm not able to, uh, uh, I'm not being heard, which I think is part of what you said. Um, yes. Not, okay. It's a, that is such a powerful point. And again, it might be right that they're not hearing you properly. But what we've got to look at, if it's painful, that's because we have this neediness to be heard. Got to look at whether it's that or not. We so attachment to the the deepest you heard the deepest attachment we have. And I'm not saying it is this in this case. It might be, but the deepest attachment to for more than sex and drugs and rock and roll and husbands and wives and babies. The deepest, most primordial attachment we have is to being seen and heard by others. Why? Because we don't validate ourselves. Yeah, it's not coming from that. It's because I'm trying to ask a question to understand something. So it's not that I'm saying it so that they go, oh, yes, that's right. It's that I'm asking a question, but I think they think I'm saying, oh, this is the way that you should think. So that's where I feel like I'm not communicating because the question I was asking was when they said we don't talk about politics in my mind I go well to me like we only we're only talking about ourselves in my mind I go but my reaction to the things around me they're not separate from me they are part of me so those things I will feel because they're a part of me so where's the difference between what I'm allowed to talk about is only about my immediate, like, relationship to my dog no, and my daughter. I think that's totally fine. I think that's completely appropriate to, to state that case. I agree with that case. I agree with that case. That means talking about our own mind. And this is my point also to Julie. It's not self-centered. To talk about... This is what I'm saying about the Buddha's practice. The first level is only about your mind, only about your mind. It's not self-centered if you're trying to solve it. It's self-centered if you just want to moan all the time. But mm. it, that's it, it's very clear that if you want to discuss world events and your response to those world events, that also can be seen as personal. But, okay. you know, 
so we've got to be clear. There's nothing yeah. wrong with talking about ourselves as long as we recognize what the problem is. It could be something as small as the barbecue smoke coming into my, but if yeah. you're recognizing <laughs> your attachment and your aversion, then it's a very powerful discussion. If it's just moaning, then I agree it's an utter wank. And it's revolting. And I wouldn't even Thank hang you. around in the that, meeting. I'd no, hang that up and really, go home. really, really helps because, yeah, Good. my thing yeah. was like, you know, yes, we're all suffering. And yes, relative, yeah. if the smoke of your neighbor is upsetting you, yeah. that's the same as me being upset about something huge. It's still the same upsetness. It's, but the key one is more than that, even, is to recognize the, the, the problem. It's called attachment. It's called anger. Yeah, it's called jealousy. Exactly. It's called a, it's yeah. whatever, that's, if that is the result, then it's a valid discussion. It was yeah, not it's just no, making. that's fantastic. You answered Good. that because I've been really Good. struggling with that. Good, darling. The differentiation. Good Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, sweetheart. Go on, Amir. What was the point? I was just. Um... A comment, you know, for, you know, you mentioned, uh, well, just craving in the context of the extreme of addiction, which I have some experience with. You know, for example, you brought up uh -huh. the example of uh, not eating, you know, every piece of cake you see. Well, you know, I'm right, exactly. chomping yes, every right. piece of chocolate I have here. But, right. I mean, yes. what do you do to get interfere, you know, to, to cut that cycle where you just don't feel like. I mean, to me, it's easier said than done to say, you know. Of course it is, okay. but you've got to say it first. And everything is discipline. It's like you're learning to learn anything. You've got to know what's involved, then you have to practice it. That means you've got to make a decision. I mean, that's why, you know, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision, you know, okay, I'm only going to eat three pieces of chocolate. You've got to first mentally decide. I, okay, put the words, I want to mentally decide that I'm not just going to, every time I see food, just to blindly put it in the mouth. If that's, if that's the habit, you've got to be precise with yourself. You know, you've got to be very clear in your decision. And my feeling is if we're very precise with ourselves, when we decide to do something, we will do it. We'll practice it. But if we feel, oh, it's not possible, I can't do it, the cake's so delicious, how can I say no? Like you said before, I'm always going to have attachment to romantic. I mean, if you feel you really can't escape that, then you probably won't. But if you feel that it is possible to develop other parts of your mind, Amir, that it is possible to change, this is, the, this is what we need. We need to know we can change. And then we have the humility to practice it slowly, one step at a time. But to decide. We're very intelligent. We can do that. Do you understand? Thank you. And we've got to, but the other crucial point is we've got to have a, a, a really good reason for deciding. If it's just because you think, oh, I should be a good boy, I shouldn't eat too much cake, it won't change much. You've got to see the benefit to yourself of changing. Don't put that down. That, we often miss that in the West, in the world. We think that's self centered. The first stages of Buddha's teachings are. We are the beneficiary of controlling our body, speech, and mind. This is his methodology for us to become more fulfilled and content. It's his methodology for us to become more fulfilled and content. So we have to be motivated to want to give up attachment and give up anger and give up resentment and give up self-centeredness because I'm sick of suffering. With that motivation, we, we will change. Just to do it because you think you should, that's not enough. You've got to see the advantage to yourself. That's not being self-centered. It's intelligent. What else? Do you mean? There's another question from uh, Ray. Okay. She said first, she said, thank you for your previous answer and that it seemed to her like joy is naturally generous which I have another comment about, but first I'll read her question. Thinking about the precepts, is anger an attachment? Why is there a precept against an elemental slice of being human? I lost that past bit. What did she say? What did the person say? Uh, is anger an attachment? Why is there a precept against an elemental slice of being human? An elemental slice of being human. This is the piece I have absolutely no understanding of. I think she means uh, anger. What's the question then? Refine Why is the question there a precept for me? against anger? 
But I, uh, beyond that, well, I don't know. Well, well first of all, there's no precept against anger. Precepts usually are about the body and speech. Uh -huh. Lord Buddha's precepts are the very first level of practice to control the servants of our mind. So he suggests we don't kill and steal and lie and so on. Then Buddha gives his analysis of the mind and the, the, the key the answer to your question is this is buddha's analysis of the mind you don't have to like it i mean you say it's an elemental piece of of humanity or whatever you said i mean the buddha would this is his whole point sweetheart this is his entire point i said at the beginning what he has found from his own experience which is the basis of all buddhist practice that the sources of the source of everyone's suffering are attachment anger jealousy and the other delusions in the mind they might be elemental and indeed they are but he has found that one they are the source of our pain but two he has found a method to get rid of them that's why that's the answer so that's for you to find out you mightn't like that idea that's up to you sweetheart no one's asking you to believe buddha it's a shock in the west because we give equal status to anger, attachment, love, compassion, as if they're all equal parts, valid parts of a valid person. So valid that you'd be wacko if you didn't have some of them. That's how that's what we think in modern psychology and neuroscience. So this view is radically different. But it's not as if it's new. It's been around for 3,000 years, for God's sake. Just that we haven't heard it before. We don't join the dots, maybe. So if it is true... That suffering comes from attachment and aversion and the rest we had better learn to understand what he means by them and then observe our own minds to see the pain they cause us and then be revolted by the suffering and want to get rid of them that's our part of it nothing to do with believing it we have to taste the truth of it and buddha might be wrong he might be leading up a garden path it's for you to find out What do you think, Ray? Anybody else have questions? No? Nobody else? Okay. Quick one. Yeah, go. Absolutely. Go. Do you think there'll ever be a time in, in humanity where we'll actually all get it? <laughs> I, I know it's the the they thing. What, I know they say that's what keeps the bodhisattvas going because this is Buddha's analysis, because every mind has the potential to be free of suffering and full of joy and bliss and clarity and wisdom and kindness and compassion, that that is our natural state. Because we all possess the potential, then yes, of course, theoretically it's possible. That's what keeps us going to want to help others because it's possible. Because it's possible. So we can keep optimistic, you know. We've got to do the job. There's no shortcut. We've got to do it. You can't mandate it. You can't force someone else. You've got to do it yourself. So don't hold your breath. Put it that way. Don't hold your breath. So go on. I want to know what Ray thinks of what I said. What do you think of what I said, Ray? Just curious. Uh, uh, Ray wrote, I think that sounds wonderful. Thank you. Okay. I mean, you didn't have to say it like that. It <laughs> sounds wonderful. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. What else people, anything else? I'm a, I'm a little curious. I feel like I've talked a lot, but I'm a little curious about uh, sort of something that, that you've touched on a couple of times is this, uh, when, when we reduce the attachment, uh, the, the uh, joy arises and uh, well i mean slowly slowly not overnight slowly. yeah 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 i mean that's yeah. the point because attachment is hard to give up so initially it's painful yeah to give up attachment. but eventually is what i'm saying in the gradual long-term process the result is more fulfillment because you're more content so it's not overnight there's no way in the world i mean the very first time you stop eating that cake if you're a junkie for cake you have a nightmare yeah but the it's like you go to the gym for the first time. You know the result, but not tomorrow. You won't. If you come home, you're going to come home after the first day at the gym, not feeling better, but even worse. 
because it's a process before you become gorgeous looking. So it's like that here. This is the Buddha's logic. And so we can hear what he's saying is that when we can recognize the, the emotional hunger of attachment and how, and then imagine being less emotionally hungry, it's logical. The yeah. opposite is more fulfilled. Yes. It's logical. It's logical. It's not mystical. And it's not like a, some, it's not like reward. It's the natural consequence of it. As you get less attached, less angry, less neurotic, you gradually become more connected, more fulfilled, and then more compassionate. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. My the, point. the joy arises and the joy, I'm thinking about the joy of connection in particular and love. And I'm wondering, this is a sort of theoretical question, but in your experience, you've been doing this a long time. Is it, is it is it as worthwhile or more worthwhile or less worthwhile to cultivate uh, loving love in the sense of, you know, the Brahma Viharas or however you want to think of it, or to, sure. uh, or to focus and, and, and work towards reducing your attachment, or is it? Oh, darling, listen, this is where the two, I mean, you know, really for me, it is right gradual, you know, um, a, a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So the wisdom wing is what we've been talking about so far, which is the job we need to do to become the person we can become. So you don't just do that in isolation. And then this is a bit like the retreat mode. The ideal way to do this is go up to the mountains and you do it very intensively, but then you'd come down and now because you're less neurotic, you're more connected. So then you'll be practicing love and compassion for others. But we mostly will do it gradually in our lives and we'll do it, we'll we do them together bit by bit. But the logic is this, the degree to which you're caught up in self-centeredness and misery and attachment and anger is the degree to which you cannot be loving. And even if you try to practice it is extremely painful it can be an antidote like i said to amir yeah. we can try to think of the other person instead of always me 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 and that's good practice there's atomic bomb on it but the you, you, the emphasis i mean it's like stages of practice the first stage is control your body control your speech control your mind because they're the troublemakers then as you get better at that love and compassion become easier and then you would actively practice love and compassion as a direct antidote to being self-centered definitely yeah. i mean look at relationships every day you're forced into that you know you yeah. want to get what you want at all costs, but you are forced to shut up and you're forced to be patient and try to do the other person's wishes. That's good. That's practicing love and compassion. That's wonderful. Yeah. But we've, got, we've got to know our capability. We've yeah. got to know what we need to do. We've got to know what we're capable of. You know? Yeah. Very important, that one. In other words, a person can be in a relationship and they're kind of a very nice, quiet person. They're mummy's little helper. But they got so much attachment to being seen as a nice girl. That's their main suffering. They end up getting abused and misused and treated like a doormat and wonder why because it's their attachment. So that person has to stand up and have courage and say, well, I'm out of here, baby. They've got to look like they're being selfish. Not at all. They're being intelligent because they need to get past this, this what looks like being kind, but it's just huge attachment to being seen as a nice girl. And then, and not really, not really practicing love and compassion. It becomes like neurotic, you know, and then you get used and abused and wonder why. I mean, look at the world. So many people in that relationships like that. Mm -hmm. we're terrified to do what we want we're terrified to stand up for ourselves as if for somehow we're being selfish that's a big mistake mm -hmm. so we've got to know where we're at and what we need to practice you know thank you beautiful All right. beautiful mm. hello mary you pop popped out of nowhere mary's in mary's in where are you darling timbuktu or somewhere i forget I'm idaho no cleveland <laughs> Cleveland, that's right. Sorry. So, darling, you have a question, Mary? Anything? Oh else? no, I just, I just am so grateful. I get, I have to always hear you again and again and again, because oh, I went from living in a sanctuary type situation in the boondocks of northern New Mexico, a very quiet, peaceful life, to now living with family that I've been away from for forty years, and it's. it's uh, it's um another kettle of fish altogether <laughs> yeah so i just need to keep listening and listening to how is it going you're pretty going well you love your sister <laughs> that's well yes i do but 
all of my all the recommendations and beautiful tactics. None of them worked. None so. of them worked. So that means you didn't get the outcome you wanted. So you got to give up on wishing it'll happen and just be kind and be loving no matter what. That's this is an, that, that reminds me of some other point. This is a good point, Mary. It, I, you didn't say it explicitly, but it's a really interesting point. So there's Mary, not to, not to give her away, but she's working with, as she just said, she just said it, and in a particular scenario with her sister, right? And so the thing is this, let's just say we decide to be loving and kind and patient with the mother, with the sister, whoever it might be. Part of our problem is our attachment, walking alongside the love and compassion, is frantically expecting the person to change. Because look how hard you're working. And then they don't change. And then we think, well, I was a failure. No, you weren't a failure, Mary. You're practicing love and compassion. Just because you didn't respond to it does not mean you didn't change. Did, um, not, doesn't mean you didn't do the right thing. So we often, the attachment wants the person to, you know, like you've been kind to your mum and she keeps keeps complaining and you keep thinking, well, if I keep doing more, she'll be satisfied one day. No, she's got to give up attachment to be satisfied. So we've got to really not judge our behaviour if we're working hard at being kind because they don't, because they don't change. You get my point, Mary, be content with your own efforts, you know, that's a really interesting point. Oh, well, it's been a, it's, a, I, I, constantly have been trying to examine that because it's it's affected my my mind that I feel like my self-worth like I keep thinking what did I do wrong that's it exactly exactly and you did nothing wrong you do no. everything yeah even to the point where um like I tried, I, I mean, I did the hundred dollar gift. I did the cards, the letter, and then yeah, I did, a, um, I even sent a thank you. Uh, cause she took my mom to an appointment the other day. She told me I insulted her by sending a thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> so whatever you do, it's always, the, it's still the, even the wrong thing, even worse. See, See, this is okay. This is exactly my point, Mary. You did all the right things. So, of course, you did them in the hope that she'd forgive you and love you and think you, you know, but but don't think you failed because she didn't change. That's exactly the point. There's nothing more you can do. So stop trying to change her. Love her for who she is and let her be as shitty as she likes. Let her think you're horrible. And that's powerful practice, honey child. It's nice if the person changes, but if they don't, do not judge yourself based on that. You are not a failure because the change, you, you gave her the opportunity to change. She doesn't know how to take it. So just have more compassion for her. That's it. And know that you, you are doing your best every single day. So that's exactly my point. Yes, exactly. That's a powerful one. Because we desperately want the other person to respond, you know, that's exactly the point. Look, it's suddenly 10.30, time to go. I've got to get up early in the morning, go to the airport, so I'll finish now. Um, okay. Rubina, may I ask you a question, quick question? And then yes. but first, thank you so much, so much. This was so beautiful. I, I, I was so looking forward to it and exceeded my expectations, and I'm sure Good. I'm feeling very grateful as well. Um, I did put links in the chat for staying connected mm -hmm. with the Dharma Collective and also Good, donating, donating to support Rabina and uh, and the. No, collective. no, I want you to support the group, not me. I want you to make donations to the group. I offer whatever donations you give me to the group. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate fine. that, Rabina. What I, what what I wanted to ask so very much. That's very very gracious of you. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, what you were planning for two weeks from now, just so people can get a sense of. Do they, uh, I don't they, know. We'll, we'll, carry on. we'll carry on the conversation. We'll go in another direction from this conversation. You'll give us more wisdom, more of your beautiful wisdom. Thank you so much. We'll, just, we'll, keep, we'll keep moving. We'll keep moving. Okay. I'll sing, a tiny prayer in, I'll sing a tiny prayer in Tibetan. Just make compassion grow and grow. Jang chub sem chog rin poche ma khe pa nam khe gyu chi khe pa nyam pa me pa yang gong ne gong du pa wa sho. That's it, everybody. Keep moving and never give up, never give up, never give up on ourselves and then others. Okay. Thank you so much. See you soon, darlings. Thank you. you.